Hi, Hakeem with Brittany. I'm so excited that you are joining this week. If you're new, this is a podcast that focuses on biohacking in accessible and more affordable ways. And I just bring on various female and male biohackers who kind of aim for optimal health and kind of get there through traumatic events or use different strategies that not a lot of people know about. And that is exactly who I have on the podcast today. His name is Peter Jensen, and we actually met a while ago. I was on his podcast or his like Facebook Live event thing that he did, and then he came on mine and we recorded like shortly after. And this episode is definitely a quite different, I would say, from what I have produced so far. It's very profound, and he shares a very traumatic accident that he went through when he was younger. So definitely just listen for things that you can do in your own life if you have gone through similar traumatic events, whether emotional or physical, and just really see what you can take from it because all of us have obviously been through something and it differs for different people. And sometimes it is purely psychological and emotional. And sometimes it is more physical and people get into accidents and things happen. So his story is very inspirational and it's very different. And it blew my mind the first time I heard it. And he has just been biohacking for 15 years, like one of the OGs, honestly. So it's really cool to bring him on and let him share his stories and his tips and especially for the younger generation who's listening to this podcast who have so much life ahead of them and ahead of us that, you know, taking biohacking steps doesn't really seem necessary. Whereas he kind of proves that if you work on preventative health now, you can reap the benefits for the rest of your life. And that's kind of like what I advocate as well. I'm all about preventative health and playing the long-term game when it comes to my health, especially like mentally and physically for sure. So I hope you enjoy this episode. It's quite different. Let me know what you think. And I look forward to having you listen next week as well. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you so much, Brittany. It's a pleasure to be here. So as a biohacker, you have been biohacking and into optimal health for about 10 to 15 years now, which is incredible. How would you say that you really got started in the beginning? Like, What was the catalyst towards more of an optimal health life and thinking? It's hard to tell exactly when it started, especially because when I started, there was no such thing as biohacking. We didn't really call it that, you know? They just called me weird and strange, and that's about it. (laughs) But I was always searching for a better way of being. I can go back to probably the early 90s when I was doing this, you know, in my early teens. But what I can tell you is when it really changed was with an accident I had. Now, this was a big accident. This was in 2005, November 18th. You know, it's funny how you never forget these dates, right? So it was November 18th, around nine in the morning. I was at a gym in London, England, and the cable crossover machine of the gym ripped out of the floor and it landed on my head. Wow. Uh, Quite horrible because, of course, the most horrible part about it is that it happened in a gym and there are mirrors everywhere. So I saw this happening to me and I was helpless because the cable crossover machine was just falling on me and I was still holding onto it. I couldn't let go because physics just would not allow me. And it was just waiting for the inevitable crash. And it hit me right in the head. It created some brain damage. It broke my nose and a lot of little pieces. They ha- it had to be reconstructed. And you know what? When they rebuild it, they left it exactly the same still a little to the left and that kind of annoyed me (laughs) why couldn't they just put it straight (laughs) that's funny but then it also broke my l2 Mm. so left me partially deaf it left me without the ability of reading and writing and it took away my ability not only to walk properly but also to control my own digestive system wow so it was a big problem it was bad 
So I survived it through some strategies that I have, mental strategies that I have, which, you know, happy to share with you at some point. But I survived the instant because of those strategies. And then when the doctors told me that I was never going to be able to read and write again, and I was never going to be able to, to walk properly again, I looked at the doctor sitting next to my mother and I said, you know, I understand where you're coming from and your experience with what you have seen shows you this, but if you don't mind, I'm going to choose my own reality. And so I did. And my journey began. I started doing things like neurohacking, using frequencies more than anything. And uh, then I started using scents, just specific smells that would create some sort of neurological response. Started reading up about well, not reading up because I couldn't read, but I started asking to get me information on neurogenesis, adult neurogenesis, how that was going to be created. I started talking to people. I, start, I created my own podcast at the time because I had to do something. I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting there. So I created my own little podcast. I had an old, one of those old Macs, those G3 ones, the really nice ones with a big ball at the bottom, and the screen that moves around. <laughs> and some of the first voice-to-text software that we had. So I was doing everything voice-to-text. I created my own podcast called Power Source. I couldn't maintain it, but you know it's difficult. And you're going you're gonna to see it's an awesome journey, but it's not that easy to, to do a podcast and be consistent. And I had guests who helped me. And it was really pretty amazing. It's amazing how much you can learn by just having a platform where you give people a voice. So I started optimizing my health through different forms of nutrition, through different forms of uh, neurohacking, biofeedback, and so on. It was never even expensive to do it. It was actually really quite cheap to do it. Right. But I think that you had the right mindset from the get-go coming out of that awful incident, especially the fact that you had the mirrors there and you could see it happening, like yeah. how traumatizing is that? And then coming out of that and not accepting the fate that the doctor said that you had. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of it, right? Is like you kind of took what could be your life and you changed it for the better. And, and that's huge. And that takes a lot. That's not an easy thing to do. Well, I've been doing that for a living for other people for 23 years now <laughs> as a coach, because that's what I am. My main thing is I'm a leadership through emotional intelligence coach. But mm. this whole process is about also your biology, about optimizing your systems. And I've always been into it, really. And the mindset was there because I already knew some of the strategies to get people out of desperate situations. This was a desperate situation, which I chose to turn on its head and make it a really good one because I started trying to discover how I was going to help people in my same situation. So did you choose to have that mindset every day? Was it, I'm going to wake up today and be positive. I'm going to grow every day from this. This is how I'm going to move forward. Was that every day or were there still those really difficult days where you questioned it all? Okay, so anybody who tells you they've been through an accident like this or through a really bad situation in their life and tells you that they've always been positive is lying. For starters, I don't have any memory between the, the 19th, because I still remember the hospital and everything, but when I went to sleep that night, I don't remember anything up until the 15th of March, 2006, because of all the drugs they put me on. I was on beta blockers and uh, gabapentin and painkillers galore. In fact, they sent me home. This is the system in England, the NHS. They sent me home. They, they told my, my partner, you know what? We might as well take him home because you know, there's a 50-50 chance here that he's going to survive or not. So you want to make him comfortable at home? That's good. But here we actually need the beds. Wow. So she took me home. And the next day, I don't remember anything. The first thing I remember is waking up one morning and thinking, oh my God, I'm fat. And it's bad. I mean, I used to, I weighed a lot, but it was a lot of muscle there. And all of a sudden, it's the same weight, but it's all just, I would like to call it bleh, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I try to get out of the bed, but my legs wouldn't work, and I just hit the ground. Wow. And I saw the medicine that I had, and I didn't know what it was because I couldn't read, but I knew it was medicine. And I just thought, this is doing this to me. What's going on? 
And that was my first memory. And then from there, my outlook was quite fatalistic at that point. It's like, why can't I move my legs? Oh my God, my life is over. It's ruined. It's gone. But then I caught myself doing that and I decided, no, 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 this has to change. I had a small daughter and she was in a room close to mine. And I kept on thinking about her and thinking about my life and things changed. I immediately started saying, okay, I need to find a way to get better. Most days were bad until they were good. Most days were bad because I depended on somebody else to do everything for me, including go to the bathroom. Mm. It was a horrible experience, but at the end of the day, it made me who I am today. And I remember things that were going through my head, like, how am I going to get out of this house so I can see the world again? And I started asking myself all these questions. How am I going to get better? How am I going to walk again? How am I going to be able to read and write again? And I started teaching myself how to read and write again. I used mind maps. And through mind maps and using my daughter's books, I started learning how to recognize letters again, using binaural frequencies that I myself created before my accident and then started perfecting after it. I started to learn how to read again, recognize letters, recognize words, recognize sentences. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm reading 450 words per minute, and then 600, and then 800, and now I'm at 1,500. But the doctors wrote me off. They said, that's it. It's more about how you're going to adapt than how you're going to get better. And that was that category they had put me in. They basically gave me a disabled badge and said, this is your life. So the only good thing about that was parking. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no. But the best thing was the mindset that shifted. It really did shift. And the responsibility I started taking over my own body and my own mind. And when I started, they said, well, you know what? And I do not recommend people do this. I really don't. But in my case, it worked. And I just said, I'm going to stop taking all these medications, all of them. That's it. I don't want any of it. And so I stopped completely. That's Some cool. of these medications are dangerous to stop. Yeah. You know? So I did. And the mindset changed. And I started saying, I'm not going to eat that. And I started choosing better food and I started choosing better nutrition. And then I went over and I found somebody who was doing colon therapy, colon hydrotherapy. So I thought, okay, well, they, this might help me get rid of some of the stuff in my, in my body. That's what I thought at the time. So I started doing that and I started going to the gym and start working on my own core strength first and arms as well. And then little by little, I started through a whole bunch of techniques, getting physically better. None of these things cost me. Okay, the, the colon hydrotherapy did cost, but none of these things cost me anything. It's just all about mental attitude and about choices. I choose not to eat bread. I choose not to eat pasta. I choose not to eat rice. I choose not to eat starches and carbohydrates because they're not going to do me any favors. I choose to eat healthy fats. So it's all these things that I chose to take away and all the things I chose to add and through food, I really started learning how to live a different life. That is like such an amazing a healing journey that you've been on and that I'm sure you're still on today. So for the people who have been through trauma either recently or like in the last couple of years, whether it's as physical as yours was or just more mental and emotional, what would you recommend? Like, How would you help them get through it? Okay, so... The key thing to trauma is that it's going to be very emotional. Mm -hmm. And there are three aspects to emotions that we need to take into consideration, three focuses. One is the physiological focus. This is where biohacking comes in very handy. Another one would be the mental focus. This is where coaching comes in very handy. And the other one is the linguistic focus, where philosophy comes in handy. So from the biohacking perspective, you need to be able to understand your own body. So the first thing is change your posture, really just change your posture. It's really important to be able to breathe correctly. And like we were talking the other day, you and I, just check out Wim Hof. He's got some really amazing stuff out there on breathing techniques. Or check out Tim van der Fleet. He's amazing. And uh, we do a lot of work together, Tim and I. And we do a lot of breathing exercises, which really help get rid of stress. So if you, got, if you have a trauma, whatever that trauma may be, 
You want to reduce the amount of stress that you have in your body and in your neurology. You want to reduce the amount of stress hormones that you have in your body. So a great way to do it is through breathing exercises. Now, both Tim and Wim have amazing exercises which really do help create a balance of your hormonal system and it'll help you really activate your parasympathetic system. And this is important because this is where you repair yourself and where you rest and where you digest. So the cheapest biohack I can recommend is breathing techniques because right now, at least for now, it costs less than water. Just simply breathe. You know, it doesn't cost anything. Nobody's taxing you for it. Yeah. Biologically speaking, that's the first thing I would, I would say. Second, you want to start releasing some endorphins as well. So do exercise. And cold therapy really works as well. That's from the biohacking perspective. From the neurohacking perspective, I would say be careful with your coffee consumption. Still have it. Bulletproof coffee. Awesome. Be careful with the consumption of medicine, the medication. Because remember one thing, once you start taking medication for things like depression and, and, uh, and trauma and stuff like that, you are not really a client of the pharmaceutical company. You become their subscriber. And believe me, they upgrade that subscription pretty quick. The moment you take something that's going to be active on your neurology, it might start creating a problem in either your stomach, your liver, or your kidneys. And then you're going to upgrade your subscription to something that sorts out that problem. And that is going to cause another one. And then the medication that you're taking for, your, for whatever neurological situation you're under, you're going to have to upgrade that as well because eventually it's not going to be effective enough. So be careful when you start medication because you might end up subscribing to things that you never even thought you were going to take. Next thing you know, you're going to have a cocktail of, I had 28 pills in one day, 28. Wow. Right now, it's the stuff that I choose to have, and it's the stuff that I, I know is good for me, and it's the stuff that I know how to balance correctly, and they don't cost as much as medicines do in terms of money and in terms of your own health. Yeah. So just be very, very aware of what you're going to be doing in terms of medication. Still see the doctors. It's important. You don't want to cut something out that's going to affect you in a very negative way. But if you've gone through trauma, the most important thing is talk to somebody who can help you with it. Don't try to deal with it yourself. Please don't. It's important that you do see a professional for it, whether it's a physical trauma or an emotional one. The emotional traumas tend to linger longer than the physical ones. Yeah. I see that a lot with friends and family of just these traumatic things happening and then dealing with it in the moment, but then suppressing almost the after effect of it, of mm -hmm. actually dealing with it. So they'll just go day to day and pretend it never happened or just like suppress these emotions and start to get into habits that are almost like the opposite of it. And then years go by and they actually haven't dealt with the one event that happened. And it sounds like you dealt with it pretty much straight up. And I think that's because it had such a physical component that you almost had to. But do you find with what happened to you, is there any part of the emotional and mental part that you feel like you still haven't fully healed from? Or do you think that you've fully healed from that trauma? You know, this is a really good question because the emotional part that happened after that was much more profound because I lost my family because of it. My partner took my daughter away. Now, have I healed from that? The answer is you never heal from that. Yeah. But you learn to live with it. You learn to live with it. And then you ask yourself, how can I help others in similar situations? Well, you know, I'm an expert in the human condition, especially talking about emotions and interactions. And I know how to deal with it very well. So for me, you never heal from the loss of someone you love, but you can learn how to live with it. And you never heal from certain emotional pain, but you can allow it to make you stronger and to build and forge your character. And the key thing is, let your character be forged into something that's stronger than steel, but let your heart remain soft and vulnerable so you can still be open to love and to acceptance of others. And that way you'll never lose empathy and you'll always be able to create a better world for yourself and the people around you. So have I healed 
and most of it I have, the things I haven't healed from, I've learned from, I've adapted to, and I help other people deal with it too. So I wouldn't change a thing. That's the crazy yeah. part. That's crazy. But I mean, I, I get it. It's also, you know, what happened to you was so devastating, but it made you who you are. So, you know, it's only devastating if you look at it that way. Yeah. And initially when it happens to you, it is devastating. But then you realize that there's a lot of really awesome things that come because of it. You understand how fragile life is. You understand that it will come to an end. There's one, (laughs) a book I keep on reading over and over again. And I mean, I read a lot. I read about five books a week. Wow. And one book that I keep on reading every single month is called A Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi, who was a samurai. In fact, he was a runin. It's a samurai who wasn't attached to any shogun, so a loner. And at the very beginning, he says, generally speaking, the way of the warrior is the resolute acceptance of death. So... When I came to understand this, I came to understand that death is something that's going to happen. It's inevitable. It is the one thing that every single human being has in common that unites us as the human race, the one commonality. That if you're alive today, you will die at some point. This is important. And this is very beautiful because it's one of the biggest fears we have in life. And the funny thing about fear is that it's the only thing that gets smaller as you get closer to it. And when you look at it that way and you start understanding that death is inevitable and you need to accept it, then your fears sort of start melting away. And it's really cool. And you learn so much from them. And then all of a sudden you'll discover that you're afraid of something else. And then you become brave and you confront it and it becomes smaller. And this is a never ending thing. There are things that you're just going to be afraid of. And there are so many ways to deal with it. And I deal with things emotionally, but I deal with things biologically as well. With my quality of sleep, I have terrible sleeping habits. And I've been trying to correct them for the past, I'm 42 years old. I've been trying to correct them for 42 years. And when I was a kid, my parents had two nannies. And the reason was I slept three hours every night. That's all I slept during the whole day, they say. Well, this carried on until, I mean, pretty much today. Right now, I have ways to make myself sleep much better through biohacking techniques, through optimization of my neurology. Things like, for example, breathing techniques, appropriate nutrition, knowing when to drink water, knowing when not to. The last thing you want is to all of a sudden have interrupted sleep because you didn't know when to take water. And all of a sudden, your bladder is full and you got to wake up because you need to go to the toilet. And then it's hard to go to sleep again. But you have to do it because if not, you're going to wet the bed. So let's get up. And then what? Then you turn on your Netflix and do what? Make sure you binge until morning. And then then you're tired, exhausted. Brain doesn't work right. So you grab a cup of coffee and you grab, you know, I don't know, a sandwich or you grab a, a something sweet, a donut or whatever. And then your energy peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. So you need to know how to control everything. And for most people, it's, it's a big process of self-discovery. It's a lot of change. Most people don't want to change. Did you know this? Yeah. It's easy to get comfortable. It's very easy to get comfortable. And I think that it, ties back into the fear that you were talking about, right? You get comfortable in your routine and where you work and where you live in your apartment. And then doing anything different is you're afraid of change and that's huge. So like just touching back on the fear, like what would you say to somebody, you know, a millennial or like under 30, whatever, who is afraid of these changes, but knows that they have great health benefits if they were to do them, but they're afraid to start, they're afraid to do them. Yeah. Because we're afraid of change. It's so interesting. This is why that quote that I gave you from Miyamoto Musashi is so powerful. Because once you're able to confront the biggest fear, which in most cases is death, a fear of change becomes so, so minute. And then you're able to do things that you know you can do to optimize the way you are instead of procrastinate on them. A lot of the times, you know what you're, you need to do, but you feel so comfortable that you simply think it's okay not to do it. Because I'm all right right now. 
You know, one of the biggest problems we have in, in society today, and I'm not, forget society, in this civilization, is that we got too comfortable. We got way too comfortable. And all of a sudden, what happens? You just have to go to the store and you can get anything you want. And you buy a whole bunch of stuff because you tend to go to the shop when, it's, when you're hungry. And then you buy a whole bunch of stuff, you put it in the fridge, and then because it's there and it's available, you simply eat it, right? Or it's Uber Eats and you don't even leave your apartment. <laughs> exactly. You can get anything you want to your door. You know, this is what I'm, one of the things I'm very happy about living here in Spain. I live in Alicante, which is right by the beach. There are almost no takeaways here. There's almost no uh, delivery services. So I actually have to go out and buy things, which is great. And then there's little markets, one every Wednesday, one every Saturday. And then I can go there and get organic local products, which is great for me. It's fantastic. And I have a little shop right, right by the beach. I, leave, I live about 100 yards from the beach and about 80 yards from here towards the beach. There's a, a nice shop and they do everything organic. And that's fantastic. Even if I wanted to, to, uh, to purchase meat, they, they have the best meat from sustainable sources and it's all certified and everything and you just get there. It's a little more expensive, but trust me, if you buy food that's locally sourced and it's organic, it's got no pollutants or anything in it, you're going to spend more money. But in the long term, you're going to save a lot because you're not going to get sick or you're not going to get ass sick. So you're not going to have to spend time off work, time away from loved ones, time away from being productive, and money on medication, time in hospitals, time in uh, clinics, time at doctors. You're not going to waste all that time, time that you're never going to get back. All you really need to do is buy something that's a little bit, a little bit more expensive, but a lot better for you. Yeah. And we're not, even, we're not even touching the service here. We're not talking about supplements. We're really not. We're not talking about supplements. We're not talking about, uh, about expensive neuro hacks. We're not talking about any of those things. We're talking about really simple, basic stuff that you can do that can change your life and you can change it forever. We're talking about breathing. We're talking about eating better quality food that eventually, and in the long run, it's going to be more cost effective for you. We're talking about drinking enough water because people don't do that. And no, I'm sorry, even if, if you drink the most awesome bulletproof coffee, it does not count as water. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like saying, oh, yeah, you know, I've got my burger and chips here. That's okay, because I've got my veg and my chips are veg, right? No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. So it's little things like this that you can do that help you be more socially responsible, but it helps you be more responsible with your own body. Yeah. I think one of the things that I see with young people is almost like a disconnect between how you're living right now and the effects that it'll have in the future. So 40s, 50s, 60s, and on. Mm -hmm. And this kind of this like sense of immortality, like I'm young, I have so much of my life left, like it doesn't matter what I eat, I can metabolize things really quickly, I'm not gaining weight, I'm sleeping fine, you know what I mean? Like that kind of life that you're in where it's pretty easy to stay healthy, but then, you know, as the years go by, it gets harder and harder, like mid-20s, late 20s, suddenly things are starting to hurt, and you know what I mean? Like it kind of goes downhill a bit. But to the people who are in that mind frame right now, like what would you say to them? Like how would you encourage them to go to the farmer's market and buy better food and to look at their sleep now so that when they're older, the health benefits are there for them? I'll tell you how my grandfather encouraged me. He said to me, look at me, because the way I see you, that's the way I used to see myself. And the way you see me is the way you will see yourself in the future. So if you don't take care of your body, things are gonna happen to it. Don't feel you're immortal and invincible because the more you feel you're going to be, you're immortal and invincible, the harder it's going to hit you. And my uncle told me once, when you pass 35 or 40, you wake up every morning and if something doesn't hurt, you check that you're still alive. Wow. That's depressing. <laughs> it's a little bit depressing, isn't it? It's like, oh, what? Uh, okay. And you know, so right. <laughs> this is what, it, what happened. I started racing motorcycles when I was a really young kid. My father gave me one of these little mini motorcycles when I was like six. And then he gave my first go-kart when I was eight. And yes, I grew up in a very privileged lifestyle. I did. I had service living in the house. I had a chauffeur. I did. Things changed a lot. 
they changed a lot with time. But I'm not going to be one of these people who say, oh, I had nothing and I, I came from nothing. No, I came from a lot. And I, I'm, I'm proud of that. But I'm also proud of the big falls I've had and how I had to get up. But the thing is this, <laughs> with all this stuff happening, I started creating a life for myself when I was a kid that was unbelievable. Extreme sports everywhere. I mean, I wasn't doing motocross. I was doing freestyle, which is, you know, in my time, you couldn't do backflips. That was just impossible in a motorcycle. You just, that just never happened. But we did really crazy tricks. And I started climbing. I started you know, a lot of climbing, skydiving, base jumping. You name it, I did it. I was surfing a lot. I was, you know, I just, I just go out and have so much fun. No matter how much nutrition you take in the future, if you've banged your body up so hard when you're young, you're going to feel it. Believe me, I take the best, some of the most expensive supplements that are out there. I'm 42 years old, and I know most of your listeners are going to probably be around half my age, but 42 is not old. And I'll tell you one thing, I go to the doctor pretty much, I go to a, to a hospital pretty much once a week to check something different. But it's not because I'm sick. It's because I'm a biohacker and I want to make sure that I, everything's going well. But that also means that at my age, I have enough money to be able to do it. And believe me, my niece, I'm doing everything I can to repair the damage that I created when I was 15, 16, and up to the age of 35. My shoulders, I'm doing everything I can to repair from the damage I caused by doing stupid things whilst I was skydiving or, or climbing. It has a consequence. And no matter how good you are at biohacking, once you've created a certain level of damage to your body, it's so much harder to repair it. So I'm going to tell you the same thing my grandfather told me. You look at your elders. The way you see them, that's what you're going to look like eventually. So take care of yourself because you're not invincible. You're not immortal. And the one thing that unites humanity today is that we're all going to eventually die. And if you feel immortal, feel it. Don't act it because you're not. It's nice to feel that you can live forever. And I never want to take that away from anybody, but act responsibly. Because if you don't, believe me, you're shortening that life. And you need to know that. So if you don't want to spend tremendous amounts of money in the future, take care of yourself in the present. It's much more cost effective. I love that. You're just dropping truth bombs this morning. It's great. And that's like a big part of biohacking is preventative health. It's working with the now for a better tomorrow. And that's a lot of like what I try and talk about. And it's kind of what got me into it as well. So I think it's amazing the journey that you've been on and having your elders say that to you and have that awakening because a lot of us don't really have that. We're so consumed in technology and Netflix and our phones and social media that there's no accountability for any of that. So I'm so happy that you shared that. That's awesome. Hey, whatever I can help with, you know. Like I always say, I am a man. I'm just one man and I cannot do everything, but I will never refuse to do that which I can. Yeah. You can totally see that throughout your life and like the healing journey that you've been on. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast and just like sharing about that. That was incredible. I feel so inspired and just talking about fear and getting through trauma was really incredible. Yeah. And we didn't even touch too much on the biohacking aspect, did we? I guess not, but a part of biohacking is the mind part, though, and is the emotional part. It really is. And if you're really interested in, in hardcore biohacks, I've got so many. So just reach out. I'm very, very happy to share the knowledge. It's not what I do for a living. So that I'm very happy to give for free. So, That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Everything Peter and I talk about will be linked in the show notes, as always feel free to reach out to him. He is always the person I recommend to people if they have gone through traumatic events or accidents, whether emotional or physical. He's definitely just like a wealth of knowledge and is just so helpful in this area because of the hardships that he has been through as you learned when you listened. So yeah, check him out and let me know what you think. Next week, I have on a friend of mine. Her name is Kayleen Tinker. And she is such a beautiful person inside and out. And we just kind of go through her hormonal and pregnancy journey. 
she's been through a lot and struggled with a lot in that area and really opens up for the first time about it actually because she hasn't really talked about it yet in front of other people so it's it's pretty profound as well and it, it's really nice to have someone share about fertility issues and having issues getting pregnant and really what you can do naturally and holistically and there's so many different things that you can look at rather than just IVF or certain modalities or practices like that. So she dives into that all about nutrition and various things, which is one of my passions that I actually want to get into. So it's it's a good conversation and I'm excited for everybody to hear it. So let me know what you think and subscribe and have a great week. I'll catch you next week. Bye.